Central to Phone Show 100 was supposed to have been a get-together of geeks from around my area, giving user testimonies, stories and anecdotes, plenty of fun, plenty to report on, plenty to do on camera. Unfortunately, this stuff got in the way. Snow and more snow, roads were impassable, and so on. The meet has been postponed until sometime in the spring, but don't worry, I've still got a packed show for you. In a surprisingly quiet, in terms of phones, consumer electronics show in Las Vegas, the most interesting new phone release was the Motorola Backflip, an unusual design that folds and flips backwards so that its keyboard and screen are both facing out and with a touch-sensitive trackpad on the back of the screen. Essentially, it's the same as the Click, with a 528 MHz Qualcomm processor, moderate resolution 320 by 480 pixel screen, 5 megapixel camera Android 1.5 with Motorola's Moto Blur social networking add-ons. Happily, both the Click and the Backflip will receive upgrades to Android 2.1, Motorola has said. Several marketing and peer pressure myths have crept into the world of phones and smartphones over the last few years. And as I've hinted before, I do like to be the voice of sanity and reason. And if nothing else, to save you money at the end of the day by not buying into hype. I'll be the first to admit that a touchscreen has advantages, not least the possibility of more intuitive, more flexible interfaces. But on the other hand, touchscreen usually means iPhone accepted, a poor screen visibility outdoors, clumsier text input, especially when on the move, a reliance on having two hands free and a larger, more fragile, more droppable device. Assuming that you've decided that you do need a touchscreen, after all, the tech media will try to tell you how superior capacitive technology is when compared to, quote, old resistive touchscreens. It's true they are more responsive to human touch, but they make the device more expensive. They're impossible to use with a fingernail or gloves or stylus. They're tricky to use when you or the device are wet and they have a narrower working temperature range and the slightest touch can trigger an action leading you to picking up such a device gingerly by the edges and then dropping it and then again tim's had this problem with google nexus one so again it's not clear cut you don't need a capacitive screen the idea of push email is that immediately an email hits your email provider your phone gets it as well which is good if you need that sort of real-time alert perhaps in a business case but it only really works if you have a, a blackberry or a very carefully set up imap configuration or exchange server the majority of so-called push email systems are a bit of a con they merely check your email box every few minutes and then they send you what they find you could probably have set that up automatically yourself using a standard email app. And come on, the point of email is it's supposed to be non-intrusive. If you're going to allow yourself to be distracted from whatever you're doing every time you get an email, then that person might as well have just phoned you. And this is before you start allowing for loans and drug spam and email digests and lists. Face it, you don't need a push email. You just need an email system that works. The current darling of the tech world, OLED screens impress hugely indoors with glorious vivid colours and yes, they're the best sorts of screen to get if you never venture outside. But step into the world and that vivid screen starts to look very average, then the sun comes out and then you can't read the phone screen at all. Do I exaggerate? Only a little, but I contend that for real world use, inside and out, in all weathers and seasons, a transflective screen like the iPhones or the Nokia E90s or many others will let you see your apps and data more clearly. Of course you want one, you know you do. You're a phone show subscriber for goodness sake. It's a well-known medical condition. It's called gadget lust. But along with satisfying this lust often comes high launch prices, early firmware bugs and a lack of supporting utilities and compatible applications. Life on the bleeding edge is, as it sounds, often painful. Just wait six months or so before buying a new phone you fancy and you'll get it £100 or $100 cheaper and with stable firmware and plenty of support. Ah yes, the classic marketing trick. 12 megapixels is better than 8 megapixels is better than 5 megapixels is better than 3 megapixels. Is it? Well, well usually yes, but what's left unsaid is that 99% of users don't need anything over about 5 megapixels. That's already enough to produce a clear A4 print, if needed, and complete overkill for displayer photos on a monitor, on a TV or a digital photo frame. In fact, by going to a higher megapixel count, it's possible you'll get worse photos since the individual sensor pixels are by definition smaller and more susceptible to digital noise. 
All of which isn't to dismiss the latest crop of top camera phones, but be aware that good lighting, a high quality lens like the Carl Zeiss ones used by Nokia, a decent lens size, such as on the N95, N86 and N97, and yes, a healthy degree of user skill are far more important than a higher megapixel number. Over and over again, we see phone manufacturers omitting proper Xenon flashes in favor of weak LED ones. You don't need Xenon, they say. Xenon's too expensive. Xenon's too bulky. Xenon's too battery hungry. Rubbish, complete rubbish. When was the last time you saw a standalone camera of any quality without a Xenon flash? Admit it, all 100% of your LED shot evening photos with every camera phone you've ever owned have been disappointing. Dim, blurry and out of focus. A Xenon flash lights up a scene with a light that's 1000 times brighter for a hundredth the shot length resulting in crystal clear evening shots, whatever the lighting in the venue, and however fast people are moving or, or dancing. So you do need Xenon, it's just that there aren't many smartphones with Xenon flash available. Off the top of my head, the Sony Ericsson Satio, the old Nokia N82, the old and cheap Nokia 6220C. I'm sure there should be more in the future, let's hope. Look at the marketing for many of the Android smartphones and for the likes of the Nokia N900. It's obvious, of course, the more home screens you have, the better. I disagree. You'd spend half your time setting the blighters up and fiddling with them with widgets from all corners of the world, then you spend the rest swiping backwards and forwards trying to remember where you've put everything, and you do it all slowly since those home screens are going to slow everything down. More isn't necessarily better. There's a balance between flexibility and simplicity, and I think it lies closer to one well-thought-out home screen than the marketeers might have you believe. This concept is particularly deeply ingrained in the USA, very much network and operator led, it seems. But it's also common in Europe. You fancy a phone, so you sign up, committing yourself to as much as £800, $1,200 over an 18 month contract, typically. But hang on, you can usually get the phone on its own, unlocked to any network, with no ties, no commitments, no operator crippling, able to sell it on whenever you like. Add in a SIM-only small contract or a pay-as-you-go SIM with a data bundle and calls and even aggregate it over those same 18 months, uh, you, you'll add another £400 at most, which still saves you money on the original um, total contract price. And you get to stay flexible and free to sell and swap devices at will. So you don't need to buy your phones th through a network. Perhaps my myth-busting has tempered your gadget lust for now and caused you to stay happy with your current phone for just a little longer probably wise. And hey, with some of that saved money, you can definitely afford to subscribe to The Phone Show at two quid a month. Job done. Here's the address anyway. <laughs> there are many music applications, but Slacker Radio is the best with a really beautiful UI and variety of music in almost all music genres. And you can create your own personalized radio with artist name, location, genre, category, etc. There are hundreds of games out there for BlackBerry, but the Brick Breaker game is rocking, to use Krish's word. In the GPS category, Krish has two picks, Google Maps and Amaze GPS. Both work great, but the major difference is that with Google Maps, you have all the functions like layers, satellite view, favorite location integration via your Google account, street view facility, etc. while Amaze GPS will give you turn-by-turn -turn voice navigation free of charge. If you're in the USA and you have a BlackBerry smartphone, then you're lucky because you have access to Google Voice, which works amazingly and can help you cut your hefty mobile bills and has a voicemail facility too. There are more than 10 Twitter applications for BlackBerry and some are really rich in their UI and content. Uber Twitter has a paid version, but Chris uses the free one. It's a great application with Google and Gtalk with location-based integration with every tweet and you can send pictures or video as well with this Twitter client. Krish can't imagine a smartphone without having a social networking application, especially Facebook. RIM makes it really great as it comes within the firmware and OS itself, or is ready to download on other devices. You pick a platform and you'll find the Opera browser. It should be there in the top five, according to Krish. It's a great option to have as a second browser along with the native one, and it works amazingly. One of the best location-based search clients has rich functionality and works so smoothly that one feels like it's a built-in application and it's so easy to use. Well here Krish is including all messengers in one category, one place, as different users use different IAM services and clients, but all these clients are specially built for the BlackBerry platform by RIM itself. 
Chris is a hardcore Google user, so can't imagine his smartphone without GTalk, for example. A must-have all-in-one application for any BlackBerry user with a great, user-friendly and very slick UI, and one of the very best RSS reader, newsreader and podcasting applications Chris has ever seen on any platform. Thanks, Chris. In the last 10 years, I've owned about 34 mobile phones, and I would say that I'm a communications junkie, a webaholic, and a tech enthusiast. And it all comes down to three devices that I use now. The E63, this was roughly half the price of the E71 when I bought it. I wasn't too fussed about the GPS. It had a 3.5mm socket on it, so it was the easy option at the time. Also have a 6220 Classic. Excellent camera on this thing. I don't take any other camera with me to um, events. This one does the job perfectly and also doubles up as a phone and I use it for navigation as well. Plus I also have a Nokia N810. I would get myself an N900's next phone but Nokia has decided that they're not bringing it out in Australia which is um, disappointing. So it looks like my next phone will either be going backwards to an E90 or off to an N97 Mini. The device I'm using right now is the Nokia 5800 Express Music. I got this device mainly for its smartphone capabilities and also I like the 3.2 inch wide screen which I mainly use it for web browsing and uh, for using uh, playing videos and the music player in this device is absolutely fantastic and the output quality is also very good and I can, I've installed a lot of applications in it and I mainly use it for, for tweeting and uh, for my mails and for web browsing and also I like uh, navigating in this device which has uh, very good navigating software Nokia Maps and I also have installed Google Maps so this is my device of choice Nokia 5800 Express Music <laughs>